Good afternoon. My name is David Gallo. I'm the head of the AIFC Academy of Law, and we'd like to welcome all of you to the AIFC Academy of Law webinar series that we are very pleased to offer on a complimentary basis during these relatively unusual times that we find ourselves in. First and foremost, we hope that you stay safe and stay well and make the best of this period through learning and development and other positive uh, activities like this. And together we will manage through this, this crisis. So thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Today's lecture delivered by Professor Mark Moore is actually the third lecture in a series that we have jointly developed with Professor Moore. And that series is called Introduction to the AIFC Business Law and Practice. And recall that there are four segments. The first for those who attended was corporate law, which were general governing principles, uh, theories, and basically the academic underpinnings behind the common law uh, uh, focus on corporate law as well as corporation structures. Lecture number two was about corporate finance and capital markets. That was a bit more hands-on granular tying capital markets and corporate finance business principles to the common law legal underpinnings of those areas as that common law has evolved both through statutory, uh, regulatory, and uh, judge-made common law principles that emerge from the decisions of cases that have examined certain fact patterns. Today's lecture is on insolvency and business rescue and restructuring. We're sort of looking at the life cycle of an organization, if you will, and when things don't go so well financially, well, now there is an entire set of uh, procedures that are found in the common law and then codified in various statutory provisions, including at the AAFC. Next week will be uh, the final lecture in this series on dispute resolution and remedies uh, with particular relevance to things that may not go so well that lead to disputes uh, in, the, in the corporate uh, capital markets area. Just um, the final thing before turning it, turning it over to Professor Moore that I'd like to mention is that when we put together this four lecture series with Professor Moore, we didn't want to focus so much on the AIFC specific statutes and regulations that for those who have a civil law uh, academic and experiential background, we wanted to make sure that we were, that, that these lectures were examining those common law principles that underpin the AIFC regulatory and statutory scheme. Thus, uh, the professor who is highly experienced in the common law case study methodology, um, which is his, his background and his focus, really became the, the foundation for how he proposed to deliver these courses. So the assigned pre-work, as you know, are real English law cases um, where principles and statutes were examined in light of specific factual considerations and a logical analysis was provided and a reasoned decision was delivered and that's really the common law case study method. And this is where we wanted to provide some grounding, not only in the substantive academic theoretical principles of these areas of law, but also how judges uh, apply those principles in real life factual business scenarios. Uh, so with that, it's my great honor and my, my privilege to introduce once again to uh, the distinguished professor, Mr. Mark Moore. Mark, please. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in again this evening. Uh, am, I, am I audible, David? Yes, you are. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's interesting, actually, some of the points David was making there. Uh, I had a, I've had an interesting discussion 
uh, earlier today with one of the participants in the course about the status of English case law within the AIFC. And uh, there's a slight question mark as to whether English cases are actually binding on the AIFC court or they're just of persuasive authority, something that courts can take into account at their discretion. Uh, now, I'm not aware of any formal uh, statement as such which says whether English cases are actually of binding authority or persuasive authority. Uh, my personal view is, at least in the formative stages of the AIFC court, uh, I would expect great weight to be attached to English court decisions. And in that sense, I would expect English decisions to be treated in effect as having the binding force of authority. Uh, not least because cases in the AIFC court will be heard at first instance by English judges. Therefore, one would expect English judges to apply the English authorities just as they would if they were deciding cases uh, in London, uh, as opposed to in Nurse Elton. Uh, now, in due course, as the AIFC court hears more cases, as it gets a more developed body of jurisprudence, by jurisprudence I basically mean the, the body of case law, all the decided cases, and all the reasons for those cases that are recorded. And as the AIFC court has more and more decisions and its case law becomes richer, we may in due course see that case law developing in its own way, and maybe certain decisions in the AIFC jurisdiction might be decided in a slightly different way from English decisions according to certain local factors. I don't see that happening for the immediate future. Uh, I think in the immediate future we should treat the AIFC court essentially as an English court, subject to the fact that changes may occur. There's also something interesting which relates specifically to the area we're looking at today. The area of insolvency and business rescue and restructuring more than any other area of AIFC commercial law I'm aware of has its own distinct features and nuances which are different from English law. So this is one area which I think is of special interest. It's of special interest for two reasons I think to, AI to AIFC lawyers. First of all it's of interest for the obvious reason that we are living in very, very uncertain, very challenging economic times uh, in this COVID-19 affected world. There will be a lot of insolvencies around the world, I'm quite sure of that. There will be a lot of attempts to try and rescue and restructure companies in all jurisdictions around the world. And therefore, I think this is a crucial area of law to be familiar with at this moment in time, especially. But it's also of interest to AIFC lawyers because there are certain features of AIFC insolvency law which are notably different from the insolvency laws certainly that we have in the UK and these are worth being aware of. Uh, so uh, a few basic points. Now those of you from the AIF, sorry the AFSA, uh, the Financial, Ser Financial Services Authority Registrar, who uh, I've had the pleasure of speaking to over recent weeks, uh, will already have heard some of this material. So there will be a bit of overlap, and I do apologize to the, AF, sorry, to the AFSA people I've spoken to before, uh, if there is some overlap. Now, what is insolvency? This is a word we use very frequently. We often think of insolvency as being a general word we use for companies that are in trouble or companies that go out of business. We also talk about insolvency from the point of view of individual people as well, not just companies. We also talk about people becoming insolvent sometimes, although that's not as common. The word we tend to use when we think of individual people in financial trouble is bankruptcy. Individuals tend to go bankrupt. Companies tend to go insolvent. The only distinction, the only, the only notable exception here is in the United States. In the United States, the word bankruptcy law is used to refer to uh, individual bankruptcy 
and companies going out of business. Uh, whereas the word insolvency is not so commonly used in the US. But in the UK, we only talk about bankruptcy when we talk about individuals. We don't talk about company bankruptcy. We talk about corporate insolvency. Now, uh, insolvency is not really, well, we talk about insolvency procedures, but insolvency is really a kind of general catch-all term. Any legal procedure that a company enters when it's in financial difficulty could be referred to as an insolvency procedure. Insolvency is, isn't really a legal procedure as such. Insolvency is a state of affairs a company finds itself in. And once a company finds itself in that unfortunate state of affairs, then it may want to initiate one of a range of legal proceedings in response. So as a state of affairs, what does insolvency mean? Basically, a company is insolvent if it is unable to pay its debts, if it cannot pay its debts. And that's a very simple definition that most people could probably guess anyway. But from a legal point of view, there's actually two general definitions of insolvency. Insolvency can occur in one of two ways. Now, that general statement, and so a company is insolvent if it's unable to pay its debts, that refers mainly to one type of insolvency, which is known as cash flow insolvency. So a company will be cash flow insolvent if it cannot pay its debts as they fall due. The company may be asset rich. It may have, uh, it, it, it may own a lot of property. It may own a lot of assets, but because those assets are illiquid, as I explained last week, they might not be able to sell them easily. The company may have a restricted cash flow. It's not got a lot of money coming into its to its to its trading account, and therefore it's unable to 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 pay its debts as they fall due. In that case, the company will be insolvent. It will be cash flow insolvent. However, a company can also be insolvent in another way, which is balance sheet insolvency. A company may be able to pay its debts as they fall due. It may have cash in its trading account that it can use to pay its suppliers, to pay its taxes, to pay its workers their wages. But actually, the company may may owe considerable debts to a number of creditors, and it may not have sufficient assets to cover those debts. So companies' two main financial statements are its, ca are its, uh, it, its profit and loss account and its balance sheet. The company's profit and loss account essentially uh, indicates the money that's coming in from its trading activities and the money that's going out. Its balance sheet is the more concrete, fixed uh, statement. The balance sheet of the company denotes its assets and its liabilities. A company could be healthy from a trading point of view, could be unable to pay its debts, but if its liabilities or debts exceed its assets, it will be balance sheet insolvent, and therefore insolvency proceedings could still be initiated against it. So to be perfectly safe, from insolvency, a company needs to, it, it needs to be cash flow solvent, it needs to be able to pay its debts as they fall due, and also it needs to ensure that its assets exceed its liabilities, which is easier said than done. Some businesses by their very nature are in a perpetual state of balance sheet insolvency. Think of banks, for example. A bank conducts business by taking deposits. A commercial bank, anyway, takes conduct business by taking money on deposit from customers. When a bank takes money on deposit from a customer, it is essentially putting itself in debt to that customer. So banks which take money on deposit, by the nature of their business, are in a perpetual state of insolvency. So, Insolvency isn't it's 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 a difficult thing to measure. There's no easy straightforward way to measure it. Many companies 
but perpetually in insolvency, balance sheet insolvency anyway. Some companies, many companies, will go in and out of insolvency depending on certain events. So uh, measuring insolvency is difficult to do. Uh, and it's something which courts have got great difficulty doing in many cases. So that's what insolvency means. What does uh, liquidation mean? Now, this is another term that we come across. Uh, the, the most well-known and also, dare I say, the most aggressive form of insolvency proceeding uh, available, certainly under, under English and AIFC law, is liquidation, or the word we sometimes use to refer to it in the UK is winding up, when you wind up a company. Liquidation and winding up are essentially the same thing. Now, whereas insolvency is a state of affairs, liquidation is a legal process. A company that's insolvent may be put into liquidation, but insolvency and liquidation do not mean the same thing, and that's important to distinguish them. So liquidation or winding up is essentially the formal legal process whereby three important things happen. First of all, a, a, well, a special officer is appointed called a liquidator. The liquidator has an important dual two-part role. On the one hand, they are a representative of the general body of creditors, or at least the unsecured creditors who have no uh, proceeding rights to any assets of the company. So the liquidator is a private agent for the general body of unsecured creditors and has to represent their interests. But also the liquidator is an officer of the court and therefore the officer, that the liquidator is accountable to the court to make sure that not only are the creditors' interests taken care of, but the general public interest is served, which means the liquidator is not just responsible for liquidating the assets of the company and bringing in money for the creditors, but there is also an investigative element to the role. They're supposed to investigate the causes of the, 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 the company's insolvency as well, not least because the liquidation could be an important preliminary to disqualification proceedings being brought against the directors in the event that they are found to have to have acted wrongfully or committed any impropriety in the months or even years leading up to the company's liquidation. But from a creditor point of view, there's three important things that liquidation does. First of all, liquidation is the process whereby the assets of the company are collected and realized. Realized means put into liquid or money form. That's why we call the process liquidation, because assets are being transferred into liquid form, into money, to hopefully pay off the, the debts owed to the creditors, or at least some proportion of those debts. Second thing that happens is the money obtained from realization of those assets will be used to just charge the debts. And then thirdly, reparation will consequently be made for the company's eventual dissolution. Dissolution is basically the death of the company. Now, liquidation and dissolution are different things, and it's important to distinguish them. A company can be liquidated, but need not necessarily be dissolved. Now, in almost all cases, liquidation and dissolution come together. But liquidation is not the death of the company. Liquidation is the process of preparation for the company's eventual death. Death only occurs on dissolution. Dissolution is when the company is struck off the register and therefore effectively goes out of existence. Now, there's different kinds of liquidation procedure that can take place. Three main kinds. The third of those tends to be the most common. The first type of liquidation procedure, certainly that we see in, 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 uh, in English law, is something called a shareholder's voluntary winding up. Now, this does not happen very frequently. 
a shareholder's voluntary winding up because where a company is solvent. So it's not got financial difficulties, it's solvent, but the shareholders just decide that they don't want to run the company anymore. So they voluntarily wind it up. And usually that's a straightforward process. Because the company's solvent, it should be able to pay off uh, any outstanding debts. Therefore, no creditors will go unpaid to any extent. And therefore, we have no problem from a creditor point of view. And the shareholders voluntary winding up in a way is the most straightforward process. And shareholders of the company are able to retain control over the process of winding up. Now, that's not so common because, of course, most winding ups occur in companies that have encountered financial difficulties. The second and more common type of winding up we see is something called a creditor's voluntary winding up. Now, this occurs where the shareholders of the company decide to voluntarily wind the company up, but the company is in a state of insolvency, whether cash flow insolvency or balance sheet insolvency. Now, in that situation, because the company's insolvent, the shareholders are not allowed to retain control over the process, even though they initiated it, which means ultimately the creditors will take over the process and the creditors will appoint a liquidator. Uh, and the liquidator will then represent the creditors as a whole. So the shareholders start the process, but then it falls into the hands of the creditors uh, and who ultimately appoint the liquidator. The third and the most common type of winding up, however, is what's known as a compulsory winding up. A compulsory winding up is not triggered by the shareholders. It's triggered by the court. Typically, in a compulsory winding up, an unpaid creditor will apply to the court and ask the court to put the company into liquidation. The court will then make a winding up order, and the court will then appoint the liquidator to act on the creditor's behalf. And the compulsory winding up tends to be the most common form of winding up for the simple reason that the people controlling the company don't want to admit that it's the end of the road. Sometimes, in fact, very often, it's left to an unpaid creditor to, to, to trigger winding up procedures and apply to the court. Uh, and, and that's why we see that as being the most, the most common case. Now, liquidation is the most aggressive form of winding up procedure because it almost always leads to the, the death of the company. It's a terminal winding up procedure. It is, however, somewhat surprisingly, also still the most common form of insolvency proceeding, at least in, at least in the UK, where I'm from. Uh, winding up remains by far the most common type of insolvency procedure, which may surprise some people because increasingly, we have, in, in recent decades, we have seen a variety of other insolvency proceedings enter the picture, which try to ensure that companies are, are saved, that their business survives. But actually, if you look at the, certainly in, in my jurisdiction, if you look at the volume of insolvency cases that come before courts, winding up is still the most common in terms of the number of cases processed. However, ideally, you do not want to go into winding up. You want to save the business. So how do you do that? Well, there's other legal proceedings that are potentially available. Now, one legal proceeding that will probably not help that much in saving the business, however, is something called receivership. Receivership is a private action, which is typically bought, brought by a secured creditor with a view to realizing any assets that they have a right to repossess. So imagine I'm a commercial bank, I've lent money to the company, and I've taken security uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to support my, uh, my, my debt. Let's say, for example, I've taken a charge over one of the company's properties 
the company defaults on its loan, it's not able to repay the loan, therefore I'm entitled to take receivership proceedings, which means I can essentially, uh, I, I, essentially I'm entitled uh, to, 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 to uh, repossess the asset with a view to realising that asset in order to ensure repayment of my debt, or at least repayment of as much of my debt as possible. Uh, the, the second form of alternative procedure, uh, which again is not, not, not the greatest, not the, not, 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 the, not, not the most convenient procedure from the point of view of protecting the debtor company, is something called administrative receivership. Now, this is one of the areas where we see a, a divergence between AIFC law and English law. In the UK, we actually abolished administrative receivership back in 2002, because we saw it as being just too aggressive a procedure. Now, to explain, if a company gives security to support its borrowing for its, its other debt. A company under English law can typically give security in one of two general ways. A company can provide fixed security, so it can give, it can grant a creditor a fixed charge to a specific asset or a specific group of assets, which means that the creditor will have a contingent right to that asset. They will have the right to liquidate that asset in the event that their debt is not repaid, in the event that the company defaults on its obligations under their contract. But the creditor will only have a right to whatever asset or assets are specified as its fixed security. And in the event that the company wants to sell any of those assets, they will need to get the of the creditor to do so. Now, that can be inconvenient from the company's point of view because it means that the company is not really in a position to dispose of those assets. If it's a fixed asset that the company intends to use for many years, if it's an office or a factory or something that's, uh, you know, that, that's got long-term value, then Granting a fixed charge over it, over it probably won't be so problematic from the company's point of view because it won't need to dispose of it. But what if you're an asset like company? What if you're a company that does not actually own any real estate? You lease your properties, you lease your offices or your factories. The only assets you've really got are your stock and trade, uh, your inventory, the goods that you're buying in as raw materials the inventory, the stock that you've got that you're going to sell to customers. Is there any way you can grant security over that? Well, English law provides something extremely convenient, which is known as a floating charge, but it's only available to companies. It's not available to individual traders. If you're a company, you can grant a floating charge over your property. A floating charge, what does that mean? Well, a floating charge is essentially a charge that hovers over, hangs over all the company's property at any point in time. The company can sell some of that property, they can buy new property into its estate, and they don't need to get the consent of the creditor, floating charge holder, to dispose of any of those assets or to buy new assets. However, at the point in time, when the charge is invoked by the creditor, typically when the company defaults on any obligations under its contract with the creditor, that floating charge will crystallise. It will fix and crystallise, which means anything in the company's estate at that point in time when the charge crystallises is locked there and can potentially be realised by the floating charge holder. Now, up until 2002, in the UK, we had a procedure called administrative receivership, and that procedure is still available today under AIFC law. Administrative receivership basically allows the floating charge holder to appoint an agent known as an administrative receiver 
The administrative receiver's job is essentially to crystallise the charge and then to, to, to sell off any property that's in the company's possession at that time with a view to satisfying the debt that's owed to the creditor that appointed them. Now, the reason we abolished the administrative receivership was because we just, in the UK, we saw it as a, as a, as a highly aggressive remedy. And because the administrative receiver would very often gut the company and sell off the bulk of its assets, by the time administrative receivership was finished, it, it, it was commonly the case that there was no business really left and therefore liquidation would inevitably follow. So in the UK, we took the decision, for better or worse, we took the decision to abolish administrative receivership and to insist that any floating charge holder, when they invoke their charge, appoint not an administrative receiver, but a different form of agent called an administrator. The administrator that a floating charge holder now appoints in the UK is someone who is not just responsible for realising the company's assets for the benefit of the, the floating charge holder. The administrator's responsibility is actually to try to ensure the business is saved as a going concern for the benefit of potentially all the creditors of the company. Usually what the administrator will do in a, in, in a, a UK insolvency is try to find a new buyer for the business, which means the company's business can be sold as a going concern. And then the company itself, the legal entity is just left as a shell, which can then be liquidated, but at least the business survives in another form. Now, administration is something not formally available under AIFC law, administrative receivership remains the principal remedy. Now, I'm not saying one procedure is better than the other, but both procedures serve different goals. Administration is principally about saving the business. Administrative receivership is about ensuring that the floating charge holder gets what's due to them. So, whereas English law has become more favourable to the company and its creditors as a whole in cases of business crisis. AIFC law is certainly more favourable to the interests of the floating charge holder to ensure that they're in a position to get back the money that's owed to them. Uh, so from, a, from the point of view of a secured creditor, one would say AIFC law is the better system from that point of view. Uh, other procedures which are more amenable to saving the business. Well, AIFC law also makes something available, which is available here in the UK, which is known as a company voluntary arrangement or a CVA. These are very common in this country now. Uh, basically, a company voluntary arrangement would be used in a situation where a company is not going to be able to pay back all its creditors. Its creditors are going to have to take what's known in the finance world as a haircut, a haircut. They're going to have to cut off part of the debt that's owed to them and accept only part of their debt back. Uh, now, it may be that most of the company's creditors are willing to accept a haircut, are willing to accept uh, a lower rate of return than uh, they're entitled to under their contract for the simple reason that they want to save the business. They may, they may decide that saving the business and taking 50% of their debt back is preferable to the business going into insolvent liquidation, in which case they might actually stand to get nothing or next to nothing. So the phrase we use in English is to say a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. If you're trying to catch a bird, it's better to have one bird in your hand rather than two birds that you still need to catch. At least you've got your 50% return as opposed to nothing in the event that you take the risk and let the company go into liquidation. Now, a CVA can be helpful in a situation where most of your creditors are willing to accept that fall, that shortfall, 
but there's a minority of creditors that aren't happy and they are holding out for the full amount. In a CBA, if you can get the consent of 75% of the creditors to the, to the debt reorganisation, you will be able to impose this arrangement on the creditors as a whole, which means that the other minority creditors will be forced to, 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 to take the haircut as well. And it can be a helpful way of trying to save a company uh, by restructuring its debt making it more manageable from the point of view of the business. Now, a CVA, however, does involve going to court. The downside is it will be regarded as an insolvency event, which means it will affect the company's credit worthiness and its ability to borrow in future. If you want to try and avoid going to court, there are, of course, informal arrangements can, that can be done with creditors. Uh, for example, a workout would be similar to, to a CVA, but that would be where you try and get the informal consent of, well, you try and get the consent of all your creditors to a debt restructuring without involving the court. But because the court are not involved, you will have to get all creditors on board. If as much as one creditor is not happy with the restructuring, you will have to go to court and get a CVA to force them into line with the others. So. Uh, that's the, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages to using the courts in these situations. Now, with respect to uh, insolvency law as a whole, uh, there's, there's, there's two fundamental principles of English insolvency law. Therefore, by, by extension, I would also regard these as two fundamental principles of AIFC insolvency law. And they're not actually stated in statute, they're common law principles. The first of those, and probably the, well, I don't want to say one is more important than the other, but if there's one that's more important, it will be the first one, which is the collective principle. What this basically means is, when a company enters into an insolvency proceeding, whether it's liquidation, whether it's administrative receivership, whether it's a CVA, a company voluntary arrangement. Uh, first of all, what happens is a moratorium or stay is imposed on the enforcement of individual debts. So if you've got 100 creditors, 99 creditors are willing to consent to the restructuring. One creditor might be unhappy. Now, if you do not um, initiate a formal insolvency proceeding with a court, that one creditor always re retains the opportunity to bring down the company by, by seeking to enforce their debt individually or in the worst case scenario, applying to initiate liquidation proceedings. So the advantage of implementing a formal insolvency proceeding, for example, administrative receivership or a CBA, is that a moratorium or stay will be imposed on individual creditor actions, which means other creditors will be prevented from enforcing their rights. The essence of insolvency is it seeks, well, individual creditors still have rights to get their money back. They don't lose the right to repayment, but what they do forfeit when insolvency proceedings are initiated is the right to individually enforce the right to repayment. Enforcement proceedings become centralised in one agent. For example, if it's a liquidation, the liquidator takes over powers from all the individual creditors, and the liquidator is commonly responsible, is centrally responsible for trying to ensure that all the individual creditors get their money back. So that's a really important principle, the collective principle. The second really important fundamental principle of insolvency law is what's known as the pari passu principle, which is a Latin term. And this basically means that the assets of the debtor company should be distributed in an equal and rateable manner among its competing creditors. So essentially all creditors should be treated equally. Well, it doesn't quite mean that, because obviously, if I'm due 
$1,000 from the company and you're due $1, we shouldn't be treated equally because that wouldn't be fair because my debt's a thousand times more than yours. But we should be treated equally and rateably, which means we should get the same rate of return from the company as each other. But that doesn't necessarily mean the same amount. Huh? So what will typically happen is if we have an insolvent liquidation, therefore the company does not have sufficient funds and assets to cover its liabilities, the liquidator will typically set what's called a dividend. Now, this is different from a dividend that would be paid to shareholders. A company pays a dividend to shareholders when it's profitable, when it's been doing well. A company pays a dividend to creditors when it's not doing well. The opposite, when it's insolvent, it doesn't have enough money to pay all the creditors the total amount they're due. So what the liquidator will do is they will declare a dividend. This will typically be, uh, in, in the UK, it would be a number of pence in the pound. In US currency, it would be a number of cents in the dollar. Let's say, for example, the liquidator sets the rate of return at 20 cents in the dollar. So that means that you're only going to get one fifth back of what you're due. So if the dividend is 20 cents in the dollar, I'm due $1,000, I will get $200 back. And if you're due $1, well, you'll get 20 cents back. So we're not getting equal, but we are getting an equal rate of return back. Uh, and uh, that's typically what the liquidator will do to try and ensure uh, that, 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 that there's a fair or as fair as possible a distribution between creditors. Now, I've already mentioned uh, the, the, the two main types of security that uh, a creditor can, can, uh, can, can uh, obtain against a company, a fixed charge and a floating charge. A uh, fixed charge is also sometimes known as a mortgage. Uh, we're, we're, we're accustomed to using that term when, when we think of individual loans to buy houses. Uh, you take a mortgage, but it's, the, the, the essential element of a mortgage is it's a fixed charge over a specific asset. It's like you know, the mortgage you would, you would take out with a bank if you were to buy a house. Now, you might say, well, why would anybody take out a mortgage against a company, a fixed charge, when they could just take out a floating charge? and get this great remedy of administrative receivership over all the assets in the company. Well, do bear in mind that when it comes to ranking debts on liquidation, fixed charges still take priority over floating charge. So if you are a floating charge holder, you will be entitled to any assets the company has, minus any assets that are subject to a fixed charge. The only situation where a fixed charge will not rank over a floating charge on liquidation is where the floating charge holder has negotiated for something called the negative pledge clause. So this basically means the floating charge holder has, has, has asked the company to promise that they will not grant any security ranking higher than theirs in future, which means if the company does then seek to grant a, a fixed charge to another creditor in future, that fixed charge will rank behind the floating charge, which means realistically they probably won't get anything because the floating charge holder will sweep up all the assets remaining in most cases. Uh, sometimes we have difficulty uh, determining whether a particular charge is fixed or floating. And the case that I circulated as optional reading, a great case, is a case of Ray Spectrum Plus. Uh, this uh, was a case where this issue came up, and the case concerned uh, what's a very common practice uh, with, with many companies, uh, which is where a company grants security over its receivables or book debt. So imagine you're a company, you want to borrow money, however, you don't have uh, many fixed assets like real estate that you could potentially give as security. So what you might do instead is you might say to the bank, well, look, what I can give you is I can give you a right of security over our receivables or book debt, which basically means uh, any, any money that suppliers, sorry, any money that customers owe us 
for goods that we've provided to them. If that money's not yet come in, we can give the bank the right to that money as and when it comes in from the customers. Now, would that be a fixed or a floating charge? Now, if you're the bank, you want that to be a fixed charge because then obviously your right to those receivables, to those book debts will rank higher than uh, the, the rights of any floating charge holder. Uh, now, typically, the general rule is it will be regarded as a floating charge, so it won't have special ranking like a fixed charge would. The only situation that you would be able to make that charge a fixed charge is if the bank demands that the company opens a special bank account. The only purpose of that special bank account should be to receive the money that comes in from the, from the customers when those book debts are discharged. And then the bank must basically place a lock on that bank account to prevent the company, its customer, from using that separate account so that any funds that go in are locked in for the benefit of the bank. If the bank does that, and only if the bank does that, will the court be prepared to regard the charge that the bank has over those book debts as a fixed charge. But if the customer has any power to use the funds in the account without the bank's express consent, then it will be a floating charge, so it won't have that higher ranking. And that's the significance of the the, 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 the English court decision in the Spectrum Plus case. It's one of the most well-known, important insolvency law decisions, at least in, in recent history. One other thing I should mention is an important practice which in AIFC is known as perfection of a security interest. Now, if I have a right of security, if I have a charge over one of your assets, principally that's a private right. It's what we call a right in personam. It's a right I have against you as a person, which I can only exercise against you because it stems from our contract. You've agreed, to, I've agreed to lend you money. You've agreed to repay that money. And you've also given me securities to support your borrowing. So if you don't repay and you default on the payments, I can then exercise my right to repossess the asset and realise it. Uh, now, what if, however, the company goes into liquidation? Then we have a problem because while I might be able to exercise my right of security against you, the debtor, what about all the other creditors and the liquidator? Because in order to be able to claim my right to security effectively, I need to assert priority over all the unsecured creditors. But I've never entered into a contract with all the unsecured creditors. I don't have any legal relation with them in the way that I do with you. So this is why it's essential for a creditor to perfect their security. And in the AIFC, you perfect your security by filing something called a financial statement of the relevant security interest with the AIFCA's security registrar. When you do this, what that means is your security then can also be exercised against other creditors of the company, which means you can then assert your right over the unsecured creditors to get payment before them because, of course, secured creditors typically rank ahead of unsecured creditors. Unsecured creditors only get a chance to get their money back once all the secured creditors have been paid. Otherwise, uh, if, uh, if your security interest has not been perfected, you don't enjoy any priority. So it's absolutely essential that you do that. Uh, and. Uh, the other point to note is if we have similar charges, so say we have no floating charge and we just have two fixed charges, which of those fixed charges will rank higher? The answer is whichever one was registered first. So whichever charge was registered earlier in time ranks ahead of any later in time. So in that sense, it's a first in time rule. Uh, 
there's other things, other, uh, uh, I, what would I call them, probably, I wouldn't call them charges as such, but they're what we would call quasi-security interests, which almost have the same effect as security, in some sense can be more convenient but which don't actually require registration. So a classic form of quasi-security would be a personal guarantee. So rather than take out security over a company asset, as I've explained before in these lectures, what I might do as a creditor, if I'm a bank lending money to a company, I might simply ask the company's directors or shareholders, uh, maybe the company's managing director and majority shareholder, to grant me a personal guarantee which means they personally agree to pay back the debt in the event that the company cannot. Now that means that in the event that the company goes into liquidation, I can have a direct right of action against the director of the company, which means I don't need to queue up with all the other creditors claim against the company's assets because of a separate right of action against the director. That's what's called a quasi-security. It has the same effect as a security, more or less, but it doesn't involve actually registering any security. Uh, likewise, uh, with uh, a retention of title clause is another good example of a quasi-security. So I am advancing goods to a company. Let's say, uh, I, um, let's say I'm providing cocoa beans to a chocolate manufacturer and the chocolate manufacturer buys the cocoa beans, but does not pay me immediately and in fact the debt is not paid but what I can do when I provide the cocoa beans to the manufacturer I can insert what's called a retention of title clause in the contract which means if the cocoa beans are not paid for I retain ownership over them. Now the difficulty arises where the cocoa beans are then processed into chocolate there's a question then do I as the unpaid supplier have a right to repossess the chocolate? The answer to that is no, unless you specifically provide in your retention of title clause that you retain owner ownership over any goods that are ultimately produced from the goods that you supplied. Otherwise, the company will be perceived as having made a new thing which you do not have rights to, even though your raw materials were used to make it. But a retention of title clause means you don't have to queue up with the other creditors. Because if it works, then you basically can claim that you always own those assets all along, and therefore they're not part of the company's insolvency estate, because they were always subject to your ownership at all times. Another interesting form of quasi-security interest is something called set-off, which is very common in the common law. This would arise where you owe me money, but I, I also owe you money under a separate transaction. So let's say I owe you $1,000 for some work you did for me, but you also owe me $1,000 for some goods that I've supplied to you and you've not paid for. If you go into liquidation, uh, then I can set off my debt, which basically means I can say, well, look, I will take your $1,000 unpaid debt and I will use that to write off the debt I owe you, so I now owe you nothing. Now, what I've effectively done is I've gained myself a priority right to your debt, because I've got you to pay off my debt by writing off my debt to you. Now, that means I don't need to queue up with the other creditors, because I'm able to privately set off my debt against yours. And that would be another form of what we call a quasi-security. It's almost like giving a security but it doesn't actually involve registering a right to any asset against the company. Uh, there's other options for restructuring as well. Uh, I probably won't have time to go over them in detail, but another interesting feature of AIFC law, which distinguishes it from, from English law, is the AIFC companies' regulations specifically provide for a merger procedure. So, one way at least a company might respond to financial difficulty is by seeking a merger with another firm, perhaps a larger firm. Mergers can happen in different ways. Uh, most common way that a merger would take place 
is typically where you have two companies that want to merge, company A and company B. Typically what would happen is a new holding company would be created and that holding company would then become the, well basically what would happen is the holding company would then own shares of both the merging entities and it would do this by basically, well first of all the hold co, the holding company would be formed and then each of the existing shareholders in company A and company B, the merging entities, would be asked to swap their shares for new shares in the holding company and then an agreement would be formulated between the merging companies to carry this plan into effect. Now in the UK we don't actually have a formal procedure for a merger, in fact strictly speaking mergers do not really exist under English law. In the UK instead of implementing a merger what we would do is implement something called a scheme of arrangement under the Companies Act which actually involves, well it's, it's essentially, it's a bit like a CVA but a CVA that does not happen that does not necessarily happen in the event of insolvency. It's where you get the consent of a majority of shareholders and creditors of the company uh, to sanction an arrangement. You then need to go to court and the court need to give their blessing and make an order effectively putting this arrangement into effect. And that's the, the usual way in which a merger would be implemented in the UK. Now under AIFC law, schemes of arrangement are available under section 124 of the regulations, but interestingly a merger procedure is also available. And the interesting thing about the AIFC merger procedure is it provides a, a, a procedure whereby after the merger agreement is, 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 is effectively notified to the court, there's then a 28-day period in which any shareholder or creditor of the company is entitled to lodge an objection. The directors of the merging entities must also provide solvency statements and only once the court is satisfied that any objections have been dealt with and that the solvency statements have properly been given can the merger then be sanctioned. So that's a really interesting element, something which actually UK law, uh, English law lacks. Uh, which AIFC law has, uh, and I think that's certainly something of great value to, to, to companies incorporated in AIFC that perhaps wish to, 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 to merge, uh, you know, which, which is something that can often be, be valuable uh, in, in response to financial crisis. Not necessarily only in cases of financial crisis, companies can have very positive reasons for merging as well, of course. Uh, other responses to, to financial crisis, company might want to raise new capital by engaging in something called a rights issue. Uh, under UK law, if a company wants to engage in a rights issue, uh, it has to honour the preemption rights of existing shareholders. And this is also an important provision of AIFC law under section 48 of the company's regulations. So if you need to raise new capital and you're going to issue new shares, you have to give each of the existing shareholders the priority right for an initial 14 day window. They have an initial 14 day window period in which they can subscribe for shares in proportion to their existing holding. So if I'm a 10% shareholder in the company and the company wants to issue shares, for 14 days I get the priority right to take 10% of those shares. Once the 14 days lapse, then those shares can be issued to anybody. But for that initial period, the existing shareholders get priority. And the last point to note is just directors should be very careful in the immediate period before the winding up of the company. They have to be very careful about transactions the company enters into because those transactions could be unwound by a court the court on the application of the liquidator might decide that actually those transactions should be struck down and reversed 
Uh, and the two classic scenarios under AIFC law where this could happen is either where we have fraud and anticipation of winding up. So if in the final 12 months of the company's life before liquidation, any assets are shifted out of the company's estate with a view to depriving creditors of those assets, an order can be obtained from the court essentially unwinding those transactions. So the asset goes back to the company. Also, there's something called transactions and fraud of creditors, which covers gift transactions, uh, which, are, which are made for the purpose of putting assets beyond creditors' reach. And interestingly, transactions and fraud of creditors can happen at any point in the company's life. There is no time restriction as such. So if, for example, I mean, this would catch the case where I fear that the company may eventually go into liquidation. I don't want to lose my company vehicle. It's a vehicle, a car, which is owned by the company, but which I may use in a, for, for my own personal benefit. What I might try to do is to set up a fictitious transaction, selling the car or causing the company to sell the car to my spouse in return for a, a nominal consideration. Well, if the money that was paid to the company for the car is not good value, the court is not fair market value, the court can then reverse that transaction so the car goes back to the company so that the liquidator can then realise it for fair value for the benefit of the, the unsecured creditors as a whole. So these are just important provisions to be aware of. So thank you for listening to that, uh, that lecture. Uh, hopefully this has given uh, some of you a good general overview of insolvency, rescue and restructuring provisions that are available uh, under AIFC law, uh, many of which can be of tremendous advantage in times of financial difficulty like, of course, we are seeing in the business world today. Next week, it will be the last, the final lecture of this short series, which will be on dispute resolution and remedies. Uh, and uh, as David said, I will be uh, have a, a, I will be focusing in particular on capital market remedies available to investors. Uh, also, uh, I would reiterate uh, the upcoming training session in September, uh, which uh, I will be delivering in association with the AIFC Court and uh, the Institute of Arbitration, uh, a deep dive legal training program, corporate law at the AIFC Court and IAC responding to the challenges of a post-COVID-19 business landscape, which I'm greatly looking forward to. So please do uh, sign up for that uh, uh, if, uh, if, 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 if that would interest you, if you'd like to follow up any of the points from these lectures in more detail and in a more practical, hands-on way. In particular, we will, we will be dealing with problem scenarios uh, based on potential disputes uh, that are likely to arise uh, in, uh, in response to some of the difficulties we're seeing in the business and financial world at present. So thank you for listening. As usual, uh, I will stay online for a few minutes for any questions anyone happens to have. Uh, so uh, I will just put up my list of participants so that I can look for hands. So if anyone does have any questions, please do feel free to, to raise your hand virtually. Uh, if you do need to leave me just now, uh, thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure talking to you this evening. Uh, this is uh, once some of the limited human company I think I get at the moment in these days of lockdown. Uh, so thank you. It's been a pleasure. And uh, have a nice evening. Stay safe. Stay well, stay, stay well over the next week. And hopefully I look forward to speaking to you next week. For those of you who are able to stay, uh, please do ask any questions. I have a question from the third person in the list. I don't have your first name, but your second uh, name, Manapova. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Moore, for such a great webinar. Um, uh, can I please ask you, uh, can you, in very general terms, comment on the effect of um, enacting legislation pursuant to the ANSI-TRAL cross-border insolvency model law? Yeah. And how that can um, enhance the attractiveness of any given insolvency regime? in yeah. the jurisdiction of interest. Thank yeah, you. Uh, 
I mean, this is something I didn't have the opportunity to, to go into. Uh, I only really had time to look at the more domestic issues, but I mean, the, the, the main advantage in general terms, I mean, the, the main advantage is, uh, I mean, if you have an international business which has got creditors uh, in different countries, then there are a range of possible, uh, you know, there are a range of possible jurisdictions in which insolvency proceedings can be brought. Now, because of the collective nature of insolvency proceedings, uh, it, there's, there's, there's a general interest in ensuring that those, in, that, that, that those insolvency proceedings are unified as much as possible and preferably brought under the jurisdiction of one court or other. So essentially, uh, cross-border insolvency uh, regulations are there to ensure that there are some common rules which exist to try and establish what uh, in international private law would be called the forum convenience. Forum convenience means the most convenient the most appropriate jurisdiction in which the action should be heard. Uh, and there will be a number of factors taken into account in determining what the most appropriate jurisdiction is. So in general terms, the advantage of a jurisdiction being party to, uh, to, 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 to an arrangement like you know, UNCITRAL would be that uh, they are then, uh, if, if uh, if a creditor in their jurisdiction is affected by a particular insolvency or if a, 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 a debtor company registered or doing business uh, in, in their jurisdiction is concerned in an insolvency, then uh, that particular jurisdiction could potentially be regarded as the most convenient, the most appropriate jurisdiction in which common insolvency proceedings can be brought. Uh, I mean, there's lots more we could say about this. It's a whole separate lecture in itself, in a way, cross-border insolvency. Uh, perhaps, I mean, that's something I'd be happy to follow up with you individually if you want to talk about it in more detail. Uh, but, uh, I mean, in general terms, that would be the main advantage in being party to such an arrangement. Sorry, that's a very vague answer. It's necessarily vague, I think. Uh, are you still there? Sorry. Does that answer does that answer your question at all? Yes, Thank yes, you. I couldn't unmute myself. Thank okay. you very much Thank for you. your answer. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. But please feel free to follow up with me individually. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to scan down. Sorry, I forgot to scan down my list there. I may have missed some hands. Uh, your guests, any other issues, please raise your hand. I will give you an access to turn on your mic. And after your introduction, you can ask your issue, Kornish. Please. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Moore and uh, everybody. You, you manage? You manage? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Hi. Um, my question is related to administrative uh, receivership. You sure. said that the AFC legislation includes this procedure. And my question is, which type of creditors uh, you think um, uh, this procedure is um, uh, convenient or it supposed would, to? Yeah, it would, it would principally be for the benefit of floating charge holders because uh, standard receivership is mainly of benefit to fixed charge holders because standard receivership is a process whereby you gain control of an asset or a, or a group of assets that you have rights to. So, so to initiate receivership, you really need to have a specific asset or a specific body of assets that you have rights to repossess. Now, the advantage of administrative receivership is when you appoint an administrative receiver, 
The difference between a receiver and an administrative receiver is a receiver just has the right to repossess a specified asset. An administrative receiver has the right to take over the running of the company's business as a whole in order to take possession of all its assets, or at least all its assets that are not already subject to a fixed security. So administrative receivership is mainly a benefit to floating charge holders because the floating charge holder doesn't actually know the extent of the assets they're entitled to until the charge crystallizes. And the charge crystallizes only when the administrative receiver is appointed. You could potentially appoint an administrative receivership as a fixed charge holder if, for example, the asset that you have the right to repossess is the only asset, the only major asset the company has. But more likely, receivership would be the more straightforward remedy. So, yeah, I mean, in short answer to your question, it would be a floating charge holder that would mainly get the benefit of administrative receivership. And that's who we would expect to use this procedure in most cases. Does that answer your question? Uh, any other questions? I'm just scanning there. I don't think there's any other hands raised. I'll just give you another few moments if anybody has any further thoughts. Uh, no, well, again, do please free to follow up. Do please feel free to follow up individually if there's anything you'd like to, to uh, inquire about further. Otherwise, uh, I think it's probably an opportune time to bring this session to a close. Uh, so thank you again for your time uh, this evening uh, and listening to me. I hope to, to see you back next week for our final session. Uh, so I think without further ado, uh, I, will, I will close this session and wish you all a, a safe and, uh, and pleasant evening and week ahead. Thank you, everybody. Thank you many thanks, Professor. Thank you. You're welcome.